This week, we welcome Ed Moyle, General Manager and Chief Content Officer at Prelude Institute for an interview. Uh, in the leadership and communications segment, keep your employees and keep your customers. Why leadership development is superficial and how to fix it. Simple techniques to overcome negative emotions when negotiating with others and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. How much confidence do you have in your security program? TrustedSec is a global information security consulting firm created by Dave Kennedy with some of the industry's most respected professionals. Their team works collaboratively with your company to improve security regardless of its current maturity level. TrustedSec offers an ever-growing list of customized services including red and purple teaming, software and hardware security, incident response, PCI, and risk and maturity assessments. You can visit trustedsec.com forward slash security weekly to learn how Trusted Sec can become an extension of your team. Welcome everyone to Business Security Weekly. This is episode 117, recorded on February 11th, 2019. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, in G-Unit Studios with my awesome co-host, uh, my other awesome co-host, one of them, well, Matt is usually the primary host of the show. He's not here, he's moving and stuff. <laughs> Uh, but Jason Albuquerque is here in studio. Hello, Welcome. great to be here. And again. you got the memo about oh, Patriots God, absolutely. gear. Absolutely. How could I not represent my <laughs> first time back since the Super Bowl? Well, right? Of course I had to. <laughs> I haven't been here since Christmas on the drive in. I was saying, I oh, just bought the sweatshirt last so night. Did you really? Yeah. 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 yeah it was my, yeah, my kids my, wanted This is my to... Super Bowl gear. So yeah. I love the Super Bowl day. But. So yeah, congratulations to the Patriots. It's uh, yet it, again. It's an ama- I, 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 Of course, there's a lot of Patriots haters out there. Of course. But it's an amazing achievement when you think about. Uh, in a business context, right? The same business owner with absolutely two key players with Brady and Belichick. Uh, it just that whole dynamic. I think there's a lot to be learned the, from it. The the leadership that you learn from that organization yeah. is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I and, agree. And and we've talked about a lot on the show. Mm-hmm. And and I use it as that model of selflessness. Think about that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have you have a coach like Belichick who wants to make sure that his entire staff is kind of secluded from the hype, secluded mm-hmm. from, you know, the, the news cycles and those type of things and really pushes that type of environment down. Then you have somebody like Brady who could, you know, be making money on any team, oh, yeah. no matter where he is, oh, yeah. taking pay cuts just to, just to make stay sure there. that, yeah. And win. And yeah. win. That's, that's the bottom line, right? So. And, and another management tip, um, I've heard that Belichick's very involved with all aspects, right? Sure. Offense, defense, and special teams. And when I've heard announcers talk about other coaches and radio hosts, yep. Other coaches aren't so involved. Like they're just focused on either, mostly the offense, right, or sure. the defense, or whatever. Sure. Um, so I think that that speaks to leadership. You know, being Understand involved, the providing leadership the business, for all right? the different areas of Absolutely. your business, right, is, Absolutely. is key. Um, we've got some announcements. Uh, the first one is for Infosec World, of course, April first through the third, Disney's Contemporary Resort. Uh, a couple of people asked if they wanted to come on my Disney vacation. I, that's cool. <laughs> my my family's going to be there. We could definitely use the help of three boys. There so, you go, right? <laughs> uh, I'll be there Saturday to Saturday. Uh, you should definitely check it out. Whether you're doing a vacation or not, Orlando's a nice place to be. InfoSec World is a great conference. I've learned a lot and met some fantastic people, our guests on the show, uh, included basically through InfoSec World, uh, which is just one reason why we keep going. Yeah. Uh, we've got a discount code if you want to register, OS19-SECWEEK, gets you 15% off. Uh, we are so committed to this conference that we are also going to be there and work with some of the security vendors. So if you're interested, there's two things you can do with us. You can do a free briefing. Those are at the discretion of those analysts. Myself and Matt, I believe, are the primary ones that will be uh, going to that show. So if you want to do a free briefing with us, again, it is our, our discretion. We can't do briefings with everyone. 
Um, that's one option. You can do a paid interview, which all of our paid interviews now uh, that we do at conferences are airing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Um, so you get that 20,000 downloads per episode. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash conference request. You can learn more and make a request for either a briefing or a paid interview. All righty. Uh, announcement two, registrations now open for the first Security Weekly, weekly even webcast, which is on the wiki. I guess that's why I said that. Uh, <laughs> it's called Rise Above Complex Workflows, Practical Ways to Accelerate Incident Response. It's sponsored by Extra Hop. And I'll tell you what, Matt is the VP, a different Matt, not Matt Alderman, uh, the VP of Cybersecurity Engineering. And Matt's a nerd just like the rest <laughs> of it. Like we that's were awesome. on the test call and we were yeah. just nerding it out about threat hunting. Oh, and you'll get some insights as to some of the infrastructure things that I've been doing here at Security Weekly. Sure to do some monitoring, which is kind of like the foundation for if you're gonna do threat hunting and advanced analysis. Absolutely. Like you should know, I was telling basic things, if a switch port has utilization or a firewall has excess CPU, that could be indicators of compromise, Absolutely. but you need that other layer. And sure. so we'll be talking about all that on that webcast. You can register by going to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. We've made it easier for our listeners, securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. You can register for all of our webcasts, including an outstanding one this Thursday with Extra Hop. Uh, Ed Moyle is here with us for our feature interview. He is the general manager and chief content officer for the Prelude Institute. Ed, welcome to the program. Hello, hello. Glad to be back. Nice to have you on Business Security Weekly. You uh, appeared last year, I believe, uh, on Paul Security Weekly. So good to have you here, Ed. Thank you. It's great to be here. And so, Ed, we were going to talk about some of the things that were happening at InfoSec World and kind of delve off into a few different uh, topics. Now, the first note I had, which I like to address because I like to get up on my soapbox, uh, <laughs> and we've talked about this before, is the cyber skills shortage. And now, Ed, you were right. looking at some other talks that you thought were good. There's a, a few talks on basically hiring talented people in cybersecurity, correct? Yeah, no, there is. There's there's quite a few. Um, what I'm really excited about this year is that there's a whole summit about that, right? Mm -hmm. So they they have quite a bit of attention that's being paid to this, and and um, you know I, I, I will tell you, um, I'm not shy about this. I was a little skeptical about the skills gap thing, like early on in the process. Um, the reason why, um, well, last time I talked to you, I was working for ISACA, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, well, you know, ISACA is saying this and ISC squared is saying this. And, you know, some of the folks who are kind of in the vendor space are saying this, but is this a real problem, right? Um, so I was a little skeptical about how true the skills gap was at first. And uh, then I started to look at the data, right? And I spent a period of about two or three years, uh, you know, analyzing the data about, you know, how, how big is it? Where is it? Where is it growing? What are the positions most in need, et cetera? And, you know, now I'm convinced not only is it a real thing, but I think it's bigger than um, a lot of people realize. So the fact that InfoSec World is putting some focus on this, I think is a really good thing. I think from a leadership standpoint, it behooves all of us to uh, you know, to, to get as educated as we can and to learn some of these techniques, both for acquiring resources as well as retaining them. Um, I think it's a must do. I think some of the skills shortage, my soapbox, is that it's a, a communication mismatch, that employers are asking for skills and uh, a, a resume that like doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that a lot in extreme cases, but I think in general, the employers are hiring for specific skills when they could probably fill a lot more of those positions if they took into account the character, right? Now, I don't want to overstate that because if you've got a specific uh, issue that requires specific skills, yeah, you're going to want to backfill that. I mean, as an example, we're building our startup uh, uh, active counter or, uh, active countermeasures, right? Is because when we started, it was offensive countermeasures. But when we were building that, we're like, we really just need an expert in in cloud architecture. Like, yeah, we could go figure it out, sure, yep. but that could potentially take years of you yep. know myself and John and other engineers trying to figure it out, sure. trial and error, 
let's go talk to someone that's done this before yep. <laughs> that can help us build something as important as our cloud infrastructure. Now, typically that um, you know, is a consultant, not an employee. I think that when we go hire employees, demanding that they have certain skills when maybe they have the aptitude to learn those skills and apply them over time sure. uh, <clears throat> is a better strategy that I, can, I think will help you know, bridge that, that skills gap. Well, you know, one thing that's really interesting to me about this, and I'll, I'll you know, if, if it, uh, so I think you're right, and I think the data backs you up, right? Um, but I think the thing that is really interesting, at least to me, the reason why I paid so much attention to this when, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, I thought it was bogus, right? The reason that I paid so much attention to this was that, in my opinion, I think people are looking at it as, you know, they say like, okay, well, here's the number of, you know, there's a circle that represents the missing number of, you know, employees that, that, are needed today and that you know there's the skills gap right and so it's growing so they kind of imagine that that circle increases you know kind of along the you know the diameter increases of it right and i think in reality that's not what's actually happening right the what's actually happening is instead of a circle it's like a pyramid right and what's happening is the angle of the of the top of the pyramid is getting wider and the reason why this matters is that that um, you know the analogy that that I've used in the past, right, has been like you think of a Starbucks, right? If somebody opens a hundred new Starbucks, well, how many new baristas do you need versus how many new CEOs do you need, right? You need <laughs> the same number of CEOs you had before, mm -hmm. but obviously now you need a whole bunch of new baristas, right? Um, and really, where the need is, and and this is been borne out by the data is exactly what you're talking about, which is the, the folks who are individual contributor level, they tend to be, um, you know, they tend to be kind of the more technical resources. Um, and there's a lot of demand for that. And the reason I was so interested, right, was I was concerned about, well, what happens to existing practitioners 10 years from now when automation and stuff starts to displace folks kind of in that technical individual contributor analyst type role? Like, is it going to be that there's downward pressure on salaries and that, you know, it's hard for people to, you know, reduce his mobility and stuff like that. And that was what I was really concerned about. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's the case. Right. I, I, I think, uh, anyway, long winded way of agreeing with you, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't think that uh, technology is going to change. Right. I don't think that's going to uh, reach the point where everything is automated and we need less people maybe years and years, you sure, know, tens sure. of years from now. Uh, but even at that, there's going to be new technology that's going to require, you know, I think we're going to automate sets, yeah. some, right? It's like yep. Robin Peter to pay Paul, basically. Some of that stuff will be automated, but once you do that, now there's other stuff, like the cloud is a good example. Right. You're going to need more people uh, involved in that cloud sure. infrastructure. And it doesn't wipe out the need for local infrastructure right. either. Yeah, I mean, from somebody who's, who's very in tune with, with the data around this, my perception of this has always been that we have a short-term issue right now, fill the skills gap that we need today and over the next couple of years, and then a long-term issue. How are we filling that pipeline over the next 10 years to make yep. sure that, that that pyramid angle doesn't start going very wide to the point mm -hmm. where we don't have the skills here at all, right? So it, does the data show that we have those two type of issues and that we need to be handling it, number one, from, all right, let's start grooming talent today, maybe from inside the organization, mm -hmm. maybe from displaced workforce, folks who lost their job or want a new career and start filling them that way? Um, and then what are we doing from the education perspective? Are we, are we you know, trying to identify aptitudes in maybe middle school or high school to say, hey, wait a minute, you, know, you have the aptitude towards this, maybe mm -hmm. it's just technology aptitude, and then we start gearing you toward your strengths, so that way when you go to college, you actually have a profession that you have the aptitude to be successful in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, well, I certainly would agree with that. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm resisting very hard the, the you know, plugging the organization that I'm at right now because that's that's exactly <laughs> our thesis. Right? Uh, but but yeah no I think realistically you're right. I I think there's as you say there's two problems, right? What we know is that uh organizations are having a very difficult time filling the open uh, that technical individual contributor resource that we we're just talking about, right? They're having a very difficult time filling that. You know, that can be a 6 month or longer uh, cycle in terms of finding that right resource. In terms of the cost for that, you know, it can be anywhere from <clears throat> 25 to 35 percent of that person's annual salary, uh, you know, just to acquire the resource in the first place. And then there's a very high drop off in terms of 
once they've found the resource, uh, well, what happens, you know, what happens next, right? Do, are, do they last long-term in that position? And, 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 you know, so that's the immediate need, right? Longer term, I think there's some really interesting work that's being done about specifically, you know, call it what you want, but, you know, I tend to call it security mindset, right? But um, it's kind of about finding the resource that, you know, has the right mindset and then equipping them with the right skills sure. so that they can go out and, you know, be an 80th, 90th percentile type resource. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that makes, um, that makes total sense. I mean, you know, one of the yeah. things that, that we've done, and I've, I've mentioned it on the show before, you know, one of the, one of the best, you know, security folks we have on the team started off as a business analyst, right? Mm -hmm. And, and with the right attitude and aptitude and the want to be, you know, within the, the security world, you know, he's, he's one of the best we have in the company at this point. So, you know, yeah. it, ju it just shows that identifying the, at the, the person with the right attitude, number one, because obviously you want someone who's going to want to grow and want to be part of an organization mm -hmm. that that's going to allow them to thrive. And then, and then having the aptitude to actually do it, I think that's a killer combination to kind of fill that short term, let's call it stop the bleeding, right? Because we have yeah. to stop the bleeding, right? Today, today there's, a, there's an issue. We need to address the issue. So how do we stop the bleeding in the short term and then create, you know, this pipeline of talent over the long term? Mm -hmm. Well, what's really interesting, and not to go too far into this, right? But but what what's really interesting to me is that if if somebody is able to uh, do what you say, right, which is to kind of test for that mindset in some kind of systematic way, yeah. well, then you can do really interesting stuff, right? You sure. can start to target if you're assessing people who might not necessarily be in the security profession today, um, and you're able to find the people who are you know, who have that mindset, who would be a good resource. Cause I agree with you, right. When I was hiring for consulting teams and stuff like that, my best hires were people in the help desk or, you know, even in the business community, project managers, people sure. who, you know, give it, it's so much easier to teach the technical skills than it is to teach, you know, passion and grit and yep. desire to learn that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're able to test with that, then you to, to test for it, then you start to get, be able to do some really cool stuff. Like you can, you know, then you can start to target stuff like gender parity, right. Or, um, you know, um, you know, start to target, um, you know, income disparity, right. Sure. You can start to target some really interesting things. Mm. And the gender, I, I think there's a diversity issue in general, and we've talked about this on the show several times. Right. I, I always like my teams and see organizations teams to be as diversified as possible. Absolutely. I, that's just been my mantra since the beginning of time. I've worked personally with people from all different backgrounds, yep. races, genders, religions, right? So, and I think that's really, really healthy and important. You look at other fields though, like I feel like we get picked on rightfully so we should be <laughs> diversified, right? But other fields as well also have this issue and I think we need to tackle it as a whole, right? And not just say, well, for IT and or security, we need more, you know, women working the field. I don't disagree with that, right? right. But I think in general, if we're going to push people into the, do a better job of pushing people in general into the right fields in, uh, in this country, let's just say, and in any country, right? Um, that we need to look at it as a holistic problem. And those of you listening to the show may have picked up on like my HVAC system is having trouble like that's a male dominated field sure. at, at least in my experience yep. i haven't looked at the statistics on it but that is a heavily male dominated field and i was talking to my oldest son i'm like that's a pretty cool field like you like the engineering aspect yep. you like building work with your hands like everyone's gonna need an hvac person too it's got that Absolutely. going for it Absolutely. right um and i i think that that's <clears throat> you know, uh, a model that we could look at and say, well, you know, if we don't diversify and push people into this field, that there's going to be fewer people with these skills right. and therefore the cost of their services is going to be so much oh, higher. Absolutely. And absolutely. I think it's the same thing in IT. If we don't push more sure. people into IT, into security, right. the ones that are there, they're going to be expensive and that has some economic uh, consequences that I certainly don't right. want us to and, face. And Paul, Paul, I think we need to be intelligent about that, though, right? We want to push people who have the aptitude to be successful, right? Right, because we don't want to set yes. folks up to fail. You know, there are things that I'm good at, and mm -hmm. there are things that I'm not good at. And, Absolutely. And luckily for me, I mean, I took the ASVAP test because I went into the military. I was going to say the military has a I test for aptitude. I had no sure. idea that yep. technology was a strong suit for me. Mm -hmm. Technology and engineering, no idea, until I took the ASVAP test. They put me into a technology school, mm -hmm. and it's become my career. Literally, become my career. How do we do that to other kids, right? Because they wanted to make sure that when I joined the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. I was set up to succeed. I was playing to my strengths, not my weaknesses. That's what they want to do, right? So we don't right. want kids going to school 
playing to their weakness and then not have a successful career. Yeah, we don't want to push them in the wrong direction. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. exactly, exactly. You know, this is going to be high. This may sound highly controversial, right? But uh, one of the reasons why I got so interested in this, and you know, and like I told you, you know, like this is all day, every day for me now, right? Is is studying this problem. And the, one of the reasons I got so interested in it was less so the idea of opening the career path up to people who might not necessarily be in it, uh, you know, in it now, which I, I'm excited about that. And that's a huge driver for me. But the thing that I was really trying to address and the reason I got so excited was addressing what I perceive to be a competence issue amongst existing security practitioners today, right? Mm. And this is going to sound harsh, but in my opinion, Right. Uh, I think that there's a lot of people out there who profess to be security practitioners that just quite frankly aren't that good at their job. Right. And, you know, to the degree to the degree that we can find people who have an edge by virtue of their mindset and their inclination mm-hmm. and their personality and, and things about them as a person who are most able to be successful and put them forward. Not only does that help uh, address, you know, at risk and disadvantaged populations and stuff like that today. Right. But it also raises the skill level of existing practitioners, which quite frankly, I think that's a national security issue. Sure. I think it's a health and safety mm-hmm. issue. You know, I think, um, you know, better security practitioners equals goodness. Absolutely. And to transition to the, some of the other topics too, uh, as we've uh, got about 10 more minutes uh, on this segment, um, some of the other things that are happening at InfoSec World uh, kind of relate to this, right? In that you always need to learn something new, especially in security, in any job, but in security especially. And there's a, I think it's a workshop on uh, the Defender Mindset application security for today's leaders. Mm-hmm. Application security has become even more, I mean, I can see just diverging, while we need to work together to solve mm-hmm. the problem, the technology and application world is evolving very, very quickly, especially, Absolutely. you know, thanks to DevOps. And so I thought this was great to educate our leaders as to the things that they need to know to keep pace with application security. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, particularly application security, I mean, quite frankly, right, this is, you know, this has been a challenge area for many security practitioners for years and years, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of security practitioners come into the profession through network, through, uh, you know, kind of the infrastructure side and less so the application side. And, and, uh, you know, but if you look at, at what's happening now in terms of how organizations use technology, it's all about applications. Actually, I saw a really great graphic once. I think it was, uh, if you know Gunnar Peterson. um, Yeah. Yeah. So I think Gunnar did this, right? Where he had like a distribution. It was two graphs, right? Which is like, on the one hand, it was like where businesses spend their money. And it was like applications were way up, right? And infrastructure was way down. Mm -hmm. But then if you looked at security budget, it was like the inverse, right? Like, so a bunch of people were spending a ton on infrastructure and not so much on, on applications. And so you're, I mean, to your point of, of as a leader, how can you best develop your capability? I mean, the weak point is application mm-hmm. security, absolutely. So the fact that they're covering this from an executive, um, managerial, you know, C-level kind of way, I think is just so exciting and, and spot on. And I think they're they're absolutely right to do that. It's one of the things I like about InfoSec World is it brings a lot of people from different backgrounds, from the yeah. CISO crowd, uh, you know, IT project managers, auditors, along with folks from the security community, security engineers. Uh, so that was a good one. Um, what are some of the other things, Ed, that you'd like to highlight about uh, InfoSec World? Well, I'll tell you the ones I'm most excited about. So th- I'm, I'm really excited about, so Pete Lindstrom from IDC um, is doing a uh, keynote presentation on, uh, the, well, the focus is really about, uh, like, it's basically like metrics through the lens of perception bias, right? And I think that's really interesting because, uh, you know, when it comes to metrics initiatives, I mean, any, you know, CISO or, or you know, executive in security will tell you, you know, a lot of most ex- metrics initiatives fail, right? And, uh, but yet metrics is really kind of the, the, the gold standard or the, you know, the, the, the golden fleece or what have you of, um, really being able to continuously improve and measure yourself and kind of know uh, how your investment dollars are performing, you know, because I mean, you think about, right, con- there's an opportunity cost anytime you do anything in security. The opportunity cost is what could you have done with that same budget or resources and, stu- and, and, and time that you're not able to do because you're doing this other thing, right? Um, so like, 
really understanding the number side of it, I think is really important. And it's really, as we all know, hard to do that in practice, yeah. but you know, Pete kind of is number one, he's hugely invested in the metric side of things anyway, both, you know, both in his career at IDC, but also kind of just more generally being involved with, you know, outlets like Metricon and whatnot. Um, you know, so I'm really excited about just the fact that it's metrics already, but then the fact that uh, the, the Misty folks saw enough compelling value there to make it a keynote, you know, put the, the, a little bit of a different spin on it and then kind of bring it up, you know, raise it up to kind of an executive level. I, I, you know, that I'm really excited about. I think, you know, hearing you say that, and we, uh, did an interview, uh, with, uh, someone who was talking about this and the name will come to me, but they were talking. So metrics, I think is, we underestimate them, sure. right? Because to come up with a good metric is really hard. It, is. <laughs> it <laughs> like, really is. Really hard. And because it has to be simple, sure. right? But it has to be meaningful. And combining those two things is kind of like combining usability and security. Like, has to, has a lot of times they don't go together, right? It has to show value. Yeah. At the end of the yeah. day, I mean... But uh, it has to be simple enough for people to abs- understand. Absolutely. And sometimes you oversimplify it, and then it, it loses that meaning and value. Or you make after. it so complicated yeah. that you know the, the ownership, the board, the CEO looks at it and says, hey, right. this is too much work. Right. I can't even deal with it, right? Too, too much information. Too o- much information. information. Over- overkill, yes. right? So it's really that balance between impact, value, and, and I almost treat it like an elevator pitch, right? right? How can I stick information in front of my CEO where he can digest it, consume it, and understand it if he was riding up to the third it was, floor? It was, it was Eric Cole. <laughs> it was interesting. We were Honestly. interviewing um, <laughs> Eric Cole on Paul Security Weekly. And Eric was one of my uh, instructors for SANS you know, early on. And I remember Eric telling me when we talked about metrics, and he said, make it simple and try and do something that's meaningful or impactful. And... One of the recommendations that he said was, look at your firewall, look at how much stuff you're blocking and how much stuff you're letting out, and then do some basic graphs and say, this is how much stuff we're stopping that shouldn't be in our network to begin with. And that's going to be a compelling matter. He's like, it's... Don't overcomplicate it. And the key is know your audience, too. Yes. Who are you delivering yes. it to, right? right. I'm not going to give mm-hmm. firewall metrics to my CEO or the board. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm going to do, right? Um, that's something that I would give to maybe my peers, the CIO, something like that. Right, um, to justify the expense absolutely. is what Eric's absolutely. point was. You know, sure. for, for me, I'm, I'm saying how did security add value to the business? Yeah. How did we help enable our business to be successful? That's what mm-hmm. I'm giving to my CEO, right? right? How, how many conversations did I get on with customers about you know, our secure by design methodology so that they trust doing business with us? That type of stuff. Right, right. You know? Yeah, and, and that's, I gotta, speaking of, I gotta come up with some metrics, because you're right, presenting to the It's the audience, CEO, right? You can have five yeah. different metric sets, sets of information that you're, at every level of the organi- organization, you're mm-hmm. sharing, right? No, it's true. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I think, you know, Pete has a really, um, if you've never heard him talk about this before, he's he's so passionate. And one of the things that I really like about what he does is that, you know, it's always kind of through example, right? So it's not like he's talking about metrics and theory, because there's a lot of places that do that. I mean, he's, you know, he's kind of a real example oriented kind of guy. So he'll put out, you know, examples of what he, you know, of, of, you know, where you can, me- things that you can measure, where you can measure them and how you can frame them for maximum impact, I, I think is, is a really, you know, going to be super interesting. Yeah, no, that, that, that's awesome. I mean, there's nothing better than going to, um, going to a conference, being in a session and being able to leave there with some golden nuggets to take back with you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes that's like you had said, people speak in theory and then you leave there and say, all right, now what am I supposed to do with this? But to be able to take, you know, some solid advice and bring it back and, and deploy it within your organization, that's, that's key. Along those lines, Ed uh, and Edna were on the uh, advisory board helping uh, InfoSec World select the talks, just full disclosure. Awesome. Uh, awesome. We, and it wasn't like it was just me or Ed was like, dude, we should have this talk. You know, they, <laughs> it, no, there was like a process. Legit. There it's was legit. calls. It was a legitimate, you know, uh, process. It wasn't. We disclosed if w- there was relationships with the people who were. Uh, you know, submitting talk. Uh, some of them, like I had to bow out. I'm like, I, I, this yeah, is yeah. a sponsor, right, or this right, is right, right. you know Absolutely. someone I've known for 20 years or whatever. Sure. I'm like, yeah, I like their talk. I'm voting for it, but you know, we disclosed all of that. So, Ed, having yeah. said all that, what were some of uh, in closing uh, thoughts for this segment? What were some of the other talks or topics that you're excited about? Well, there's actually um, there's quite a few of them. I, the the uh, probably you know too many to list in the time we have. But the one I'll tell you about the one that I'm most excited about, and this is probably just a you know personal interesting. But the one that I personally am the most excited about is there's some researchers from uh, that are coming over from China 
to talk about vulnerabilities that they found in uh, you know public production blockchain deployments. And that is just super exciting to me, wow, right? Yeah. Like the fact that they're, you know, they're presenting this research, which, yeah, it's a little bit niche because it's blockchain, right? And, and you know, a lot of people are saying blockchain's overhyped, which I agree with, right? But, and, you know, I'm doing a talk about it too, right? So I'm, I'm part of the problem, right? <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but in, in actuality, like the, the, you know, the fact that it's like, you know, they're, they're talking about kind of the, the vulnerability research process and kind of an open kimono approach to it, I, I think is really interesting. So that's usually exciting to me. Yeah, there um, were several submissions on, on blockchain and I thought the board did a good job of, you know, selecting ones and sure. making sure that that topic was included. I think that's what they heard from Ed, myself and others, you know, uh, that, I think a lot of people associate it with currency, but it definitely has applications, right. and right. we need to learn and understand it, and it needs to be we part need to dem- of, demystify yeah. it, right? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, some people are on one side of the fence saying, "Ah, it's all marketing, it's all, right. it's all fluff. You <clears throat> can do it a different way." Some people are all in. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, you know. So, well, you know, just a real quick thought, and I'll keep it brief because I, I know we're short on time. But, um, you know, if you look at an analogy of like a car, right? And like the difference between what do you need to know to drive a car versus what do you need to know to evaluate whether a car is safe to operate? Like to drive it, you need to know a set number of things, but to evaluate its safety on the road, you need to know a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, um, you know, blockchain, which is a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's organizations who are evaluating blockchain use in their environment, whether you think it's a good idea or not, they are, right? And the the fact of the matter is security professionals at all levels find out about this stuff way after the fact, sure. right? So, you know, keep in mind they have to do more in order to make a risk decision about it than the folks who are doing the usage, the evaluation from a usage standpoint. So that's why I think it's so important and, and why I felt it was really important that there be enough coverage at the event, even for organizations that might not necessarily be using it today, because guess what? Like the sooner that you can get educated, mm. the more prepared you're going to be to address Absolutely. the issues when you discover them. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, sometimes to pick those technologies. Sometimes I feel like I was ahead of the curve and other times sure, I was sure. like with containers, I was kind of behind. I felt like I should have done some more stuff with them earlier on. So I don't make that mistake that I've made sometimes in my career uh, by saying, "Ah, oh, that's you know never yeah, going to take hype. off." It's all hype. <laughs> Whatever. Well, I guess with IPv6, we were probably <laughs> probably right. Although I, I you know, I say what you will about IPv6, but um, okay. So Ed, thank you so much uh, for thank coming you. on the show today. Uh, you're welcome to stick around for the next segment uh, as well uh, if you're available. But we're going to take a short break. Come back and talk about the business security news for the week, so stay tuned. 